something that the Apostle Paul did when he was attempting to make a point. The Apostle called on the saints to be cerebral, to think, to use their ability to reason. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians 10. We may shout today, we may not. I want to show you something. And this is going to challenge you because we have become a nation, a church, a world of feelers. We are emotion we our emotions are too alive. We're too easily frazzled. We're too easily upset. We're too easily hurt. We're too easily shaken. We're weak. We're weak because we don't think. We feel. Now, I'm glad that I can feel the fire burning. I'm glad that I can feel the power. But as an adult Christian, you cannot go through this life Wearing your feelings on your sleeves. You get offended when the truth is told. You have to apply so much seasoning to stuff now that you can't say what you got to say. Uh, oftentimes we give so many disclaimers. That by the time we say what it is that God has given us to say, it means nothing. Because as a people, we feel too much. We are, Paul said to the saints, to the people in Athens, you are too religious. You are too superstitious. Well, we tend to be too emotional. Uh, America today is filled with uh, people, everybody now has a grievance. You're upset about something. It's as though, in many cases, we cannot on our own handle the smallest of things. Can't handle life. Can't handle rejection. We can't handle disappointment. We, we, we're not, I want to say the collective we now. We, we, we don't do well. Uh, things that didn't move our parents, floor us. Things that would not have caused our grandparents to clear their throats cause us to consider cutting ours. And it comes from, by and large, being too emotional. Amen. I'm not, God's not calling for us to become Stoics, but you have to give some credence to the Stoics. The Stoics viewed emotion as a weakness. Now, we don't want to go to their degree. The Stoics would not allow themselves to feel. They felt that you could be manipulated through happiness or sadness. So their focus 
was to be able to focus and to concentrate on reason and to think their way through. Again, I'm not suggesting stoicism, that we become stoics, but I am suggesting that we fast more. That we crucify the flesh. The wife don't know how to say something truthful to her husband. The husband don't know how to say something truthful to his wife for fear that they're going to be offended or get mad. All preachers know that if someone needs a good stiff rebuke, uh, you're going to rebuke them for old and new. Because chances are you'll never see them again. So go on and let them have it because when they leave now, the Lord have told them their season is up. Because people, people can't take it. In the normal ebb and flow of relationships, the ins and outs of this life will flow. Stunned when it snow in the spring. Shocked. We just stand there. What's going on, Lord? It must be the end of the world. Like that, that these things have never happened before. Paul said to the saints in Corinth. Corinth, a mecca of idolatry. Corinth, a very immoral city. Corinth, a thriving metropolis. Corinth, where the temple of, if I'm not mistaken, Aphrodite was there. And where they had thousands of Prostitutes and immorality was the order of the day. Worshiping false gods was in style. Paul says to the saints at Corinth in chapter 10, verse 14, Wherefore, my, beloved, my dearly beloved, number one, flee from idolatry. It says run from it have nothing to do with the worshiping of idols and the way idolatry is manifested today. Today, we worship other things. We worship other things, things that take God's place. Anything that's in your life that is at the expense of your relationship with the Lord, that thing has become an Idol. Whether it is politics, entertainment, sports, check this out, religion, anything, work, family, your children can become idols. Your spouse can become an idol. Oh my, your goals and aspirations can become an idol. You want what you want, even if it costs you your relationship with God. That is, by definition, idolatry. Paul says to the saints, do not negotiate with it. Don't try to make a deal with it. Don't try to compromise with it. Don't try to coexist with it. He says, flee. Run from idolatry. The reason, now, he says to run from idolatry, and he also says, flee fornication. The reason he says, flee these things is there is no middle ground. There is no compromise. See, you, you know, some things you just got to walk away from. 
See, you can't commit fornication a little bit. Can't, you, can't, you can't, you know, for a little bit worship a false god and worship the god of the Bible. You're either worshiping the god of the Bible or you're not. You're either walking in immorality or you're not. It, it, it can't, they don't, there's no negotiation. So he says, what you do with that is you run from it. You, you run from it. Are you with me? Now, he says this, the next verse. This is what I want to challenge you with, and then I'm going to get back to First, uh, first uh, John. It, the Bible is so rich. And uh, this will be a part of that I'm about to show you. Uh, a upcoming, the Bible says this, what say you? My next one, it should be d dropping uh, this week. And, and it's going to bless you. I have guests and, and, and I have people who, uh, uh, and you're going to be blessed, who, who got saved. And these people, uh, they perform with the, on the same stage uh, with Michael Jackson. Uh, Peebo Bryson, Patti LaBelle, uh, and a whole lot of, uh, on BET Awards, and uh, uh, all kinds of, of all the big names, Eddie Levert, Gerald Levert, and all of them, on the same stage, at the Super Bowl, got the pictures to prove it, and, uh, but when they met the law, walked away from all that. Say amen. I will be flanked by these two persons who, who are my guests. And the text that I'm teaching from is this one. Paul says to the saints, I speak as to wise men. First of all, he complimented the saints at Corinth because he said to them, I'm talking to you as though I'm talking to sensible people. He says, I'm calling on you to be a, to, for you uh, not to feel, not to give a knee jerk response, but to think. I am calling on you as I call on sensible people reasonable people. People, listen to this, who have the ability to be objective. Some of you are objective until it comes to your children. Some of us are objective until it comes to us. Then subjectivity just take over. But there comes a time, hear my preaching now, that you have to be objective and look at a thing the objective believer is objective with a biblical worldview. You got to see everything through the lenses of, thus saith the Lord. If it's Bible, you got to submit. Well, I'm mad. Challenge your anger. Don't sit there and get upset with me. I don't like what that preacher said. You better get upset with that I don't like. That's in your spirit. Because what's deceiving you is your emotion. That's the problem. Well, I'm a grown man. Who's arguing that? I'm a grown woman. I, nobody, nobody questioning your age. What we're talking about is whether a thing is right or wrong. Praise the Lord. Now, now, listen, now listen to this. He says, let's get back to this now. I speak as to wise men. Then he says this. Judge ye what I say. He says, now, consider what I'm about to tell you. The Bible is something, isn't it? So now, I don't, I don't care how you feel about it. I want you to listen to me now, Paul says, and I want you to consider, judge what I'm about to tell you. See if what I'm telling you is right or wrong, Paul says. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging, Paul says, your ability to think. Well, I feel as, no, 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 we're going to put that aside now. Matter of fact, I want you, one of the, one of the exercises we've done in the 8 o'clock classes is uh, to teach people the ability to make their case or defend their positions while sitting on their hands. See, you need to be able to make the case without feeling anything. When you know what you know, 
When you know what you know, you, you know it without... <laughs> God, you, you, you don't have to have a hook of my son or he's coming on a Honda or anything else. You just, oh, you know it. Amen. He says, now listen. He says, the cup of blessings, which is the third cup. There in the, in the uh, Passover meal, there were four cups. The third cup was called the cup of blessings. He says, in the cup of blessings, or cup of thanksgiving, in the cup of blessings which we bless, so he's speaking of the communion, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The answer to that is yes. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Right? The answer to that is a broom. All right, good, good. Now, he says, for we, speaking of the body, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, which is the body of Christ. So he's speaking of Christianity. So when we take communion tonight, we will all become one. As we commune with the blood and body of our Lord. Right? He says, now, I want you to think about this. Then he moves from the metaphor or from the teaching of Christianity. And he moves to Judaism. He says, behold Israel after the flesh. Now he's going back to the Jews. To the Jews who were Jews by nature. Before they came out of Judaism into Christianity. So he says, Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? The answer is yes. If they eat of the sacrifices that are offered on the altar as they are offered up to God, then they are partakers of the altar. That makes sense, right? Does that make sense? Yes, okay. So he gives two examples of how uh, when, when it was Judaism, the way they became one with God was as they offered on the, the sacrifice. Offered sacrifices on the altar and as they, par, as they were partakers of the, that made them partakers of the altar. The people who was offering the sacrifice, the sacrifice represented them. So they all became partakers of the altar as it was offered up to God. And he used the example of Christianity with the communion, right? Now he moves from Christianity, from Judaism, and he moves to idolatry, heathenism, the very thing that he told them to run from. So he says, what, what say I then? That the idol, King James says, is anything. He says here, the idols of idolatry that the heathen worship, the idol in reality, that wood and stone statue that they're worshiping is in reality nothing. So he says, the idol is anything. That is, it's nothing. Or that which is offered in sacrifice to the idol is anything or better is nothing because the idol that is not a real God. All right? The idol is stone or wood. Amen. It's not a real God. The God of Christianity is the only Real God. But what about all these other religions? Those aren't real God. And they are not separate paths to the one true God. Because the one true God is a holy God. And is an intelligent God. And a holy 
an intelligent God would not have created over 2,000 or 3,000 separate paths to him that contradict each other. And then turn around and say he wants to have peace on earth. How are you going to do that? The true God. If the God of the Bible is real, then the God of the Quran is not. Both can't be the true God. Because the God of the Quran has no son. The God of the Bible has a son. His name is Jesus. They are not the same. So the idol is nothing. The sacrifice that is offered to the idol is nothing. Now watch Paul now. He says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, the gifts that they offer, now they are actually offering it though, however, to a entity. There is something behind that lifeless statue. There is, there's, a, there's a force, there's an energy, there's power in these false religions. That's something that makes a man kill himself to take you out. There's something in it. There, there, there is something that causes a man to delve into Buddhism. You ought to respect all religions. I do. I respect your right to practice any religion you want to practice. But I don't believe but one is right. Praise the Lord. And let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you something. The rest of them feel the same way. They just know how to manipulate us when they're in our presence. The Jehovah's Witness don't, do not believe that the Protestant Christian is saved. No, they don't believe that we're Christian. They don't believe we're going to heaven. The, 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 uh, uh, you'd be surprised at what uh, these people believe. They do not believe that we'll say, the Mormons do not believe that we're going to heaven. Now, we will, we, we have, we can see, we can see them in heaven. It's amazing what has happened to us. We can see, we can see, I mean, you don't have to do anything. Everybody's going to us. But other religions, other disciplines hold their ground. When the, when the preacher, the Christian minister, Stands and preaches, say, hold your ground. I'm accused of being arrogant. Self-righteous. Who do he think he is? God's man. And I'm right. The rest of them, they believe theirs. Told a preacher one time, you know, he, uh, back when we were preaching to keep Christ in Christmas, I guess to show me the preacher had a rabbi to come and speak at his church on a Sunday morning in the name of unity because we don't want to divide the community. All right? So the rabbi came and spoke in the Christian Protestant pulpit. How many know that the rabbi, however, never turned around and extended the invitation? to the Protestant minister. You know why? Because the rabbi knew better. See, we're the ones who try to retrofit our relationship with God to accept any and everything. And there are some things that the Lord simply says, come out of. Leave alone. Flee. Paul said here, even though the idol is nothing, he says, but I say 
that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to, there's a, there's, there's, there's a power behind it, to devils. The power, the power behind these things is demonic. Satan has duplicated complex religious systems. Satan has created complex teachings to rival Christianity and to shake us when it comes to what we believe. We feel the fire burning. They feel a fire burning. This is why you can't let it uh, be solely based on how you feel. You got to know something. You got to know something. This is why Paul says, this is why Paul says, uh, I'm not speaking to you as happy people, but I'm speaking to you as wise men. You young folk in, in, in college and places, when you hear these, these professors and people bring doctrines and teachings to you that contradict what you've what you've been taught in church. You stand on what you know. You don't get intimidated. You don't get afraid because they can throw some words out that you hadn't heard before. That they stump you and you hadn't heard it before. Say, well, no, I've never heard of that. Don't try to answer something that you can't answer. Just tell them, I'll get back with you. I'm like Al Green, call me. We'll get the answer to you. And that word will... Well, that there's a word from the Lord that will, that will put to rest the teachings of the devil. And um, that's, that's, this is another reason why all the parents should keep your young folk in our Wednesday night classes. Because, see, as we are preparing them to live holy and all that, we got to prepare them to fight false teachings. <laughs> Paul said they sacrifice to devils. And not to God. So even when they're not, uh, when you practice idolatry, you, you're worshiping demons. Whether you call yourself doing that or not. And Paul says, and I would not have, would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord. And the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table. And of the table of devils. You have to choose. You can't do both. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.